Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on Scadia.com. Now, more often than not, when we talk about infections, we usually discuss what organisms cause infections in the lungs, kidneys, and even the brain. However, infections can also be found in the bones and joints of the body, which is a much rarer occurrence, but is extremely important to keep an eye on since the musculoskeletal system is what frames us and keeps us up and moving. So yes, in this video, we will discuss infections of the bones and joints. So to start off, let's talk about the general anatomy of a bone. So a typical macroscopic structure of bone includes the periosteum, which is a fibrous membrane that covers the outside of bone, the cortical bone, which is the outer layer of the bone, the cancellous bone, or the trabecular bone, which is the inner spongy structure that resembles a honeycomb, and the inner bone cavities containing the bone marrow. Now let's talk about our first infection, osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is a rare infection and it usually occurs in children and affects the long bones such as the femur, tibia, and fibula. While in adults, osteomyelitis usually occurs in the spine. Now how does somebody get infected with osteomyelitis? So the various ways a bone can be infected is by hematogenous spread, which is just a causative organism being introduced into the body, carried into the bloodstream, and the infection reaching the bone. The next is by direct extension from an infected joint or skin or soft tissue. And lastly, an infection that usually follows trauma of some sort, which includes surgery or instrumentation. A rough distribution of osteomyelitis infection in the most common bones include 30% affecting the femur and tibia, 10% affecting the humerus and calcaneum, and 5% affecting the fibula. Now, the pathogenesis of osteomyelitis involves the bone forming pus from the infection, which precipitates ischemia and necrosis of the bone. Now, the central area of the dead bone is known as the sequestrum. And because bone is constantly being degraded and formed, there may also be formation of new bone surrounding the infected site, which is known as an involucrum. This pattern is usually not seen on radiographs at early stages. However, they can be useful in chronic osteomyelitis. MRI imaging is the best form of imaging to detect acute infections since it displays a detailed anatomical involvement of the bone. Now let's look over the organisms that cause the infection osteomyelitis. Firstly, the most common cause is Staphylococcus aureus. And if you have no other information about the patient, then this is the assumed organism. If a patient is sexually active, the most likely cause will be Neisseria gonorrhea. However, this is rare and septic arthritis would be more common in this case. And if someone has sickle cell disease, the most common cause of osteomyelitis would be Salmonella and Staphylococcus aureus. If a patient has a prosthetic joint replacement, we would think of Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus epidermidis as the most likely causative agents. Vertebral involvement would most likely suggest Staphylococcus aureus and M. tuberculosis. To be more specific, it's caused by POTS disease. And if there is a history of a recent cat or dog bite, the most common cause of osteomyelitis in this case would be Pasteurella. In IV drug users, 
They usually get infected by Staphylococcus aureus, but Pseudomonas and Candida are also common. Now let's talk about the clinical features. So how does a patient present with osteomyelitis? Firstly, there will be fever and pain. And usually since children are infected most, one way you could identify pain is by the child not moving the affected limb. This is known as pseudoparalysis. Later on, as infection builds, soft tissue swelling may occur and in some cases, sinus formation may also occur. A pathological fracture may also be seen. Now, a delay in initial treatment may develop a risk for the development of chronic osteomyelitis. The infection may also be localized to an area of a foreign body, such as a surgical nail or debris from trauma. How is osteomyelitis diagnosed though? Now, diagnosis is mostly done on clinical basis. However, radiological changes may develop later on in the course of the infection like we discussed earlier. An elevated ESR and CRP level can sometimes be sensitive, but they are not specific. Biopsy and aspiration of the infected site with culture is necessary to identify the organism. And the way to treat osteomyelitis is by the use of appropriate antibiotic therapy along with drainage and excision of the sequestrum. And this is usually the method of treating osteomyelitis effectively.